So tonight we are on a great subject. I already saw that Andrea Reynolds says this subject is so important. And so we're super excited for that. Oh, cool. Zenobia is here from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. That is an awesome tongue twister, and I did it really good. I'm surprised. Teresa is here with us from Mississippi. Doris is here from Ingersoll, Ontario. Awesome. We've got some Canadians, Stephanie. And um, oh, we even have someone joining us from an elementary Christmas program. <laughs> I love it. So our guest tonight is Stephanie Russell. She has been in the industry for over 18 years as a hairdresser. She's been a Redken artist. And she, like me, fell in love with the concept of coaching. So she became a clarity coach. And now she is a psychological safety facilitator, which is what we're going to dig into tonight. So please, in the, in the chat, let's all welcome the awesome Stephanie Russell. Hey, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everyone. So excited to be here. Yeah, we've got lots of Canadians in the crowd. You, you brought them with you. Oh, thank you. I, I recognize a couple names. Hi, Zenobia. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about, like, you know, because like I mentioned, you and I have had a pretty similar path because we were hairdressers. Well, and you still are doing hair. I know that. And you're still working as a Redken artist. But, you know, through that, you also became very interested in coaching. So tell us a little bit about what led you into coaching. Well, I actually, I'm sure some people on here. So if you're familiar with Johnny Stellato on here, give him a shout out. I give him a shout out all the time. Um, and his name is on my lips often because honestly, Andrew, it was a, a moment in a class with him that completely changed my life. And I know I changed my life, but it was that aha moment where I just woke up and I literally um, took the steps to live a completely different life than I was living. And from that moment, I said, oh, I need to do this um, with other people. And so, you know, I don't know how much I'm doing, but I, I will do as much as I can to help others that if they if that's what they're looking for. Great. Oh, you, you're doing lots. I know that for sure. I've I know that just even watching your social media helps me. So uh, I'm, you're, you do a lot. Hey, Victoria, thanks for joining us from Trinidad. So happy to have you here. Hi, Doris. Hi, Kelly. Um, so let's talk about psychological safety, because when when you first brought this up to me, and this was quite a few months ago, when we first kind of had this conversation about psychological safety, it's a term I've definitely heard. But until I really heard it from you, I did not understand what it is. So can you give us a little like what is psychological safety? Yeah, it's um, it started basically it was a, a term coined for big business. So for cultures and in the workplace, it essentially means that the team is able to have risk. So it's it's a team that's able to have risk taking. It's a team that is um, less judgment and, you know, or no judgment is the ideal uh, reduction of shame and the ability to have failure without feeling like it's failure. And so it got coined there, but essentially it has two aspects. It's the reduction of fear and the promotion of well-being. And because for me, those are huge values of mine. Um, when I saw it stated that way, I got super curious because I was like, OK, where can this go? And um, it's actually if you look it up, Google is the one that really put it on the map because they put thousands of hours and thousands of dollars into this research. And when you look at uh, when you survey their people, they actually say psychological safety is the reason why they stay. But it goes way beyond that because it's psychological safety in the workplace. There's psychological safety as individuals. There's psychological safety in relationships. It's, it is an overarching theme. And even the awareness of now saying the word safety, you might not actually heard it say psychological safety because it's such a big tongue twister, you know? Um, and it sounds so stuffy, but yeah. you'll hear, now that I've mentioned this to the audience, I, I actually like tune your ear into how many times you'll hear the word um, safe or the need to be safe within relationships. It's a huge topic right now. Yeah, cool. So those of you that are watching, pop into the chat. If you have heard the term psychological safety so far, just type I have. And if you have not, say I have not. Um, 
because I'm super curious to find out who here has actually how many people are familiar with this term, how many people are not. And I see um, Caddy Window, welcome, and the Hair with Gemstones Prescription LLC. I see. I love that this is being covered. Yeah, this is so important, right? Hi, Cindy. Welcome, Bethany from Pocatello, Idaho. Happy to have you guys here. So you saw this out there yeah. in the world. And you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. But what, like, how did you actually train? Like, what, what's, or let me ask that a little bit differently. How does one become a psychological safety facilitator? <laughs> uh, well, actually, that in itself, you can, there's a university course for it. So from the University of New Brunswick. Uh, that's the one I attended. You can also do it in Canada because I think it would be different depending, um, Andrew, but usually uh, it, Canadian Mental Health Association has a training as well. So it would be some higher arching organization that you could do it through. Um, you know, whether or not anybody wants to be a psychological facilitator, that's psychological safety facilitator. I mean, who knows, right? But yeah. psychological safety, um, if you want to kind of get to know more about it and how you can be a psychologically safe individual, then um, yeah, you can, there's a lot more research you can do. You can type it into YouTube, which is how I started my research. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I was looking for is cultures, like how do I help salon leaders to create a culture in which people really want to stay? That's where it started. And so that's how the term came to me. And then the breadcrumbs led me to, oh, well, I got to get certified in this because this is just juicy. Yeah. <laughs> and what a great word for it is juicy. It's juicy. So, yeah. Yeah. And I see. Yeah. Zenobia says I have. Um, Victoria saying have not. Doris has not. Bethany, yeah, and, um, despite hundreds of hours of studying psychology, have not. So that that's good to know. Yeah. yeah like I said, I've, you know, I've been a coach for 14 years now, and I, I hadn't really understood what this meant. So take us take us through like, how do we start to make our salons more psychological safe? What are some of the things that you teach in your courses and facilitate um, to help people make those spaces more psychologically safe? Oh, okay. And so this is, there's like levels to this, obviously. So the main thing we want to do is start with the awareness piece. And so what we don't recognize, Andrew, and I love the analogy of, I don't, do you remember during the pandemic and maybe the audience remembers too, that there was this, this visual of matchsticks, right? And it had the matchsticks and they were burning. And then it had one little matchstick off to the side and it was not burned because it was socially distanced. Well, psychological safety, psychological safety and being psychologically safe is almost like that in that we're not trying to distance ourselves physically from people. But if we can have awareness on how we are kind of fired up, you know, how are we in terms of are we creating mental harm, not knowing because we feel mental harm or we feel the need to protect ourselves. And mm -hmm. so in that way, are we like just kind of lighting each other up by accident and making each other um, just harmed, mentally harmed. And so psychological safety and the start of it is having an awareness around how that happens so that we can emotionally not distance ourselves because actually psychological safety is about connection, but more so I would say more um, having the capacity to be there for others without getting involved in the drama. And I don't know. I mean, I have worked in the salon industry for 18 years. I love us beauty professionals. Like yeah. we are freaking awesome. And there can be a level of drama in salons sometimes. I mean, I'm not seeing all of them, but it can be there. And yeah. so it's kind of being an awareness and Hey, it's in relationships anyway. So it's having an awareness around what parts of that drama are actually causing mental harm, Andrew. That's the first step. And so, you know, we can go down, we can go down that route just a second, but basically there's, you can, you cannot be responsible for everybody else. Right. And psychological safety is not about um, holding somebody so that we're babying anybody, because I think that that was the first thing when I started talking to salon owners about doing this program. Um, the first thing was, oh my God, I'm always looking after them anyway. You know, there's this level of responsibility I already have. Now I have to be even more responsible for their safety and, and babying them. And I thought, wow, that's, that's an amazing comment. And no, this is about holding somebody, um, 
it, holding them responsible and helping them to be psychologically safe for themselves so that they can actually learn to take bigger risks so that they feel mm -hmm. safe to do that. Right. Um, so it's yeah. actually about expanding your comfort zone. Like if you can think of your comfort zone, like a little, uh, you know, it may start off as a little box, but as we have experiences and we go out in the world, that box keeps getting bigger. But unfortunately for some of us, it doesn't get much bigger. Right. And so what do we do when we have super talented people in our salons who are maybe too fearful to really reach into that talent? So that's that's how it is um, for the salon, like, say, from uh, owner to staff to other like all of us as a team. But then there's also the aspect of awareness on how am I um, being with my clients? Because there's an aspect to the program that's all about how do I have a psychologically safe service with my guests, right? Mm -hmm. And that looks like what that looks like is the guest feels calm. The guest feels free to ask questions. Um, again, it's like a, they're not afraid to take a risk to um, have a conversation with you. They feel so comfortable, that kind of thing. And to answer your question, how does that begin? The first step is awareness. Awareness of what it looks like when we're not. Do you want to go down that <laughs> that that road? Because there's like there's a little there's a couple little avenues here, Andrew. Yeah, no, I I want to I want to explore as much as we can. So let me just kind of like connect a yeah. couple of dots here for myself, which is that it it sounds like the, really the purpose of this is to create a space that it feels safe enough that I, I feel like I can explore. And I, it, that makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, working with lots of salon owners and very often the question is, well, how do I get this person to, you know, get outside of their comfort zone or how do I get them motivated? And one of the first things that we always have to check in with them is well, what are they afraid of? You know, and if I don't feel safe inside that salon, if I don't feel that sense of safety, I'm not going to be very comfortable to push my boundaries. I'm not going to be comfortable to explore outside of what I'm comfortable with. So th it, that's what I'm gathering in my own. Like that's kind of what we want from this psychological safety. Yeah. You're a hundred percent on it. Yeah. So it's, it's all about, well, psychological safety, according to the world health organization, I got a couple stats here because I was blown away by them. Um, it's 27% reduction in turnover. It's 50% um, increase in productivity when a salon team is psychologically safe. It's 76% um, more engagement within the salons, like within the team itself. 29% uh, higher levels of life satisfaction, Andrew. Uh, then it's 26% more skills and um, preparedness. So like that's when, you know how you take a program and um, I don't know if you've ever been in this case, but I have, where I've been so fearful of how I look when I'm taking a program. Like, um, you know, is the facilitator looking at me the way I'm holding my shears? Are they looking at the way I'm applying the color? You know, who's watching me basically and not feeling safe to really even explore the look I'm trying to learn and therefore not learning it enough to really go and do it. Um, so that right there, there's a, there is an increased level of um, just being able to absorb that information and actually putting it to use. Um, faster rate of learning, uh, a 67% faster rate of learning. So the stats really show that this is when you have psychological safety, then you have a, you have an individual who is basically when it all boils down to it, they're self-assured enough that they can really play. And you and I know, like, um, from the coaching world, what it looks like to be in that creative mindset and str being stressed and being creative. They're actually on pretty opposite sides of the fence. And so um, that's why it's so important for uh, me right now in 2023 to get this out there, because I want to help salon teams to be as comfortable as they can with each other so that the culture feels great. They can they can really grow within their salons you know, um, and grow within their skills and put themselves on the social media and feel better about it, that kind of thing. So even though it talks a lot about teams, a team is made up of individual members, right? So it's it's all about making sure that each member knows what it feels like. That's a big thing for, I know you're into that too. Like, what does it feel like inside my body to feel safe? I know what that feels like. I know what psychological safe thoughts are like. So, you know, you can get pretty nitty gritty with this. And, um, and that's, that's what I want to do is get people thinking about what does it feel like? And what does it sound like in myself to be safe? Yeah. 
And I love yeah. it. Victoria just keeps posting. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> and I'm so <laughs> with you. I'm, I'm like so interested with all this. It's very cool. So I, I have a question that I'm, if we don't want to go down that road, you just say, I'd rather go in a different direction, but yeah. I am curious, is it worth, is it worth kind of addressing how do we know if we're not being psychological safe? I actually was hoping that it would go there because sometimes the way to identify if we are is actually to, to identify when we're not. Okay. And so I have, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, go to my notes here because I don't want to miss anything, but I have three mm -hmm. um, yellow light, red light, green light. Um, okay. So yeah. So you want to know if you are a psychologically safe person and this, Andrew, this hit me in the heart for a second. Now I will say, be compassionate with yourselves. So if you identify with, say, a yellow or a red light, I want you to understand I did too at times. And this is a spectrum. So I can be a green light. And I'll explain what all this means in a minute. But I just want to set this up. But I can be a green light person one minute. And then something in my environment can have me feeling a, a certain way so that I'm now a yellow light person and maybe even a red light person on certain days. So uh, somebody is not necessarily categorized all the time as one or the other. And there are ways to um, actually shift out of it, but we need to know what they are first. So, so did, um, did you just, did you just demo a little bit of psychological, psychologically safe I setup? I did. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I was kind of picking up. I have a feeling that she's making <laughs> us feel safe to recognize if we're yeah. in green, yellow or red. The, I love that. Beautifully done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for these emotions there. Yeah. So, um, and that is it too. So that's, that's actually, I'm glad that you brought that up too, because when we're working with guests or when we're um, working with our salon teams, sometimes the setup is how we create, not sometimes, always the setup. It's always the setup, Andrew, and how we create safety. Um, but I will get into, cause I know we only have so much time and this is honestly it's so juicy. Okay. So the <laughs> first part is, um, I will tell you a green light person. So this is just some descriptor. So a green light person is somebody who is curious, somebody who's open, empathetic, warm, kind, heartfelt, caring, interesting. And as uh, you know, as beauty professionals, I can guarantee you, Andrew, that anybody here, if that's where they're from, and, and all of us human beings, um, unless you're a psychopath, which is like less than 1% of the population, we all have this in us to be green lights, right? So you know, you're psychologically safe, you're a green light for psychological safety when you are those things. So I'd love to know if anybody feels like they're, you know, that's them uh, and or if that's them today, I should say, because, again, this can change. And then the next one is the yellow light. And so that's the rush, you know, um, a little self-focused and not in the way like it, it's more about with self-focus. It's more about I have so much on the go today. I can't even I don't have capacity for anything else. Um, they're uh, they're busy. That would be a word like if uh, if you are somebody I love you so much. If you are somebody who is constantly using the word busy, you're, you are, when you're saying those words, you're psychologically yellow, you're psychologically safe in the yellow zone. Um, again, I love you so much. Not ob not observant. You know, there's so much going on that they can't really see around them. Uh, has empathy. So when you're yellow, like yellow people have empathy. They just might not have the time to be empathetic. Uh, mm -hmm. and, they're, they're, and they're interested. They just might not have the time to be interested. And so when I, when I read this, I identified as yellow a lot. I was like, oh, Steph, Steph Nick, my dad calls me Steph Nick. Um, he, I was like, you got some work to do, girl. Uh, and then uh, the next step is the red light. And the red light is being unaware. It's being self-centered more so, standoffish, um, strong views. This one for me was a big aha moment because um, – I taught a psychologically safe salon class. And uh, when I said, I'll, I'll read the rest, I'll, I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, now they they have a narrow viewpoint, internally focused, unaware, and comes from hurt. And I had them look at, describe what each one is. And I'd love for the audience to do this themselves too. Like just try to think of a person who could be a green light, a yellow light, or a red light. And they called the red light Donald Trumpet. Donella Trumpet is what they called the red light. And I was like, yeah, but it was great because by the end of it, they had so much compassion for Donella because we looked at why could Donella be like that? Right. Right. 
And so a lot of psychological safety actually comes from compassion. And that's why I wanted to bring it to the salon world because I'm like, Andrew, we're already there. We have so much compassion. But the unfortunate piece is, is that we often get compassion fatigue. And so, you know, and, and burnout in our industry when we're, we're just constantly go, go, go. We're in the yellow zone. And when we are um, that busy stylist, then, um, you know, we are tending to be more yellow zone. And so we are, we are teetering on psychologically unsafe. I hope that clarifies a little. That, no, that's actually really incredible. And I, I have a couple I have a couple of questions because I definitely recognize the yellow zone quite a bit, which is, I think a lot of salon owners would probably find themselves in that yellow zone yeah. really often because there is that compassion. There is that empathy. There is a, there is a level of curiosity, but they just don't have time to do anything about it. And so yeah. I love that. I actually really love that distinction that you're in a yellow zone here. Yeah. Like you're not red light, but you're also not in the green light right now, because if you don't have time to follow through with your curiosity, you don't have time to actually be present with your empathy. It's not going to, it's not really going to create that safe space, even though that's your intent. Exactly. Exactly. I, I do have a really kind of specific question that, that might have come up for a couple of others too, um, especially because I do a lot of com coaching around communication. Okay. One of the red light um, traits was strong opinions. Yeah. So is there a way to still have strong opinions but still be a green light person? Yeah. Oh, Andrew, beautiful question. I have a feeling, you know, the answer, but I love that you brought it up. Um, yeah, I actually don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's curiosity. So you can have okay. a, strong, you can have a firm stance. The danger comes in the extremes, Andrew. And, you know, I definitely don't want to make this any political stance or anything here. Cause it's not, it's, it, it happened with, um, everything that's been happening with the pandemic, right? We had the left and the right. And so when you have extremes of either side, um, it gets a lot harder to meet in the middle, right? The further you are away from the middle, the gray area, the, the more, the longer, the harder it takes to get there. So we can't meet in the middle. So, and then think about how far it is. Like I'm trying to get myself centered. Uh, think about how far it is. Like if somebody is, is all the way on the left and somebody's all the way on the right, think about how far it takes to, to, to meet each other. One has to actually go all that way. What are the chances of that? And so the further we, the more, the further we are in extremes and the more closed minded we are, then um, that leads to psychological unsafe, but not just for, that's not just be psychological unsafe for somebody else. You know what, in the end, who cares? Like you will actually, it, and it's not about who cares, but like, if you can really be psychologically safe with yourself, then you automatically care for other people. And so mm. you want to be that for yourself. So even if you're, cause I will tell you now, Andrew, and I don't think it's anybody here. Uh, when I say the who cares part, I'm speaking to somebody who's red because if they are in that, they don't care. They can't have the capacity to care about anything, anyone but themselves. And so that's why I'm kind of speaking to them right now. If the, anybody here might be identified that in this moment in time, I'm in a red zone. I love you you it's just a point in your life but it is possible to come out of it and curiosity to your answer your question very directly is how mm -hmm. you do it. so starting to get curious and and, open, and opening yeah 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 I, I love that because i think that my curiosity came up because when i hear red light you know in strong yeah. opinions it's like well i have pretty strong opinions about some stuff but i feel pretty psychologically safe with people yeah. um for the most part, um, there's definitely some check-ins there. Me too. And I and I like that distinction that it doesn't mean that I can't have strong opinions. No. But yeah. to be psychologically safe with someone else, I do have to um, um, step in with some sense of curiosity. Because if I'm just there to tell you what I think you need to know, there's no psychological safety there. That's just me trying to control or manipulate. That's exactly it. I'm so glad you brought that up um, because that's, it's really hard to look within and say I'm manipulative, right? 
But the moment that we're trying to convince somebody, which, so there's a test that you can do. This has nothing to do with psychological safety as such, but it kind of does. There's a test that you can do positive psychology.com. I can link it after I can put it in the, in the, in the comments. Um, And you can go and you can do a saboteur assessment. And one of the saboteurs is controller. And when I read what a controller was, and that was my number one saboteur at the time. uh, And I read it and I said, Oh, wow. Wow because it was manipulation. It came from a point, a part of anxiety because I, I was feeling anxious. So I would do my best to make myself safe, Andrew. That's why I love this topic so much because I recognize so many of um, the solutions I needed within it, right? And so I would control everything because I just needed to be safe. And it, the way to do that, I'll make sure I do this. I'll make sure to tell, nag somebody to do it just to be sure, micromanage, just to be sure they got it done. I was a manager at a salon, Andrew, and if I had my time back, honestly, I would do things so much differently. And although I was good, I wasn't great. You're right. And I wasn't great because I wasn't psychologically safe because of that, because of the fact that I was micromanaging. I didn't trust anybody enough. I didn't feel safe that they would do it. And I never even gave them the chance to do it. So. Well, um, Katie behind the scenes, who's posting under the Sam via professional, she found the saboteur assessment. So oh. if you're curious about the saboteur assessment, you can, that link is now in the comments for you. Um, Shirley asked red zone. Is that a defensive reaction? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Shirley. Um, That's in, in the end, that's actually defense mechanisms are one of the awareness pieces. When we can start to recognize when we're being defensive, we can stop ourselves from going from yellow light into red light, or even realize when we're starting to go into yellow, we're just trying to self protect. Think of the word defense. It literally means to set up a defense around ourselves. And in this case, we're setting up either a psychological uh, defense mechanism or we're setting up a, an emotional defense mechanism or, um, you know, I love energetics and an energetic defense mechanism, whatever language speaks to you. But that's exactly what we're doing. And it's le- it's legitimately just to keep ourselves safe. That's it. Yeah. And I, I think what's kind of neat about this, this kind of red light, yellow light, green light concept because I started to wonder, well, how do we move ourselves? You know, if we're in the red, probably getting to green right away, right away might be a little um, too much. Yes. But it's like we could look to the yellow, right? And say, okay, can can I find some empathy? Like maybe I don't necessarily need to take full action and become Mr. Curious right now because that's not my, that's not where I'm at. But can I find some empathy here? Can I find a little touch of curiosity, you know, to, to move me in a certain direction. So I think it's a great system because I think a lot of times, especially in that red zone, we're probably a bit triggered. We're in a defensive mechanism and it's hard to get ourselves out of that. Yeah. Like when, Wendy just said, I love that. Exactly. Assess your situation. And I think that this tool is great for being able to assess your situation. Yeah, it's so simple. It's easy to use, um, very accessible. And that's that's another thing. So when so we have many pe- different people watching here and what I love about this, this whole concept is that it reaches everyone. There's nobody that it, you know, it doesn't affect. Um, and so if you're a salon owner watching this or you plan to be a salon owner watching this, one of the things that you can do, take example of that is, um, you know, really uh, simplify your communication, have open communication with people. Because one of the ways in which we accidentally cause those around us to to have more yellow light tendencies or red light tendencies is when they feel like the communication, like they don't know what's going to happen next. They're not, nobody's openly communicating with them. They have no idea. And I find that that tends to be the first step um, where people may go a little off and it's Mm -hmm. that they, they're not open. And and it could be because maybe they're feeling a little yellow light. There takes a little, there, there takes vulnerability to have open communication, but if you are not ready yet to be vulnerable, it's okay. Simplify. So don't overcomplicate your communication. Make sure you give simple directives. And if that's where you need to start, that's amazing. That's great. So um, I, that was great because that was going to be kind of where I had an axe. What are some of the like kind of hot tips, you know, for, 
for getting ourselves in the right direction. So one would be to simplify. Yeah. Yeah. Just simplify your communication. Um, the other thing and be direct, be as direct as you can. Um, because a lot of times we, in avoiding having a conversation, especially what may be considered a hard conversation, we actually let um, things fester. But what ends up, what is the festering? What does festering mean? And we know what it means for a wound, right? Because um, psychological harm actually means psychological trauma. And although it may, there's different levels of trauma for sure, but little, little traumas fester. And what ends up happening is, is that we have frequency, duration, and intensity. And so if we are frequently giving little tiny hits of trauma by not being open and direct in our communication, um, or uh, let's just say maybe we're having a yellow light um, leaning towards maybe orange, like in between, right? Um, and then we have an intense reaction to something. So we we haven't built trust yet because our interactions have been frequently kind of um, making people question and making people wonder what's happening, not quite uh, explicit enough, right? And so they're unsure. And so now we have added to it that today I'm a little intense. So my, it's coming at you intensely. Well, I, I can't take that today. But if there's a level of trust with your team, if you've had more open communication, if you've uh, communicated frequently, if you have communicated simply and explicitly, then the team members are like, oh, okay, I can take this today. I can take a little more intensity from her today. Uh, and then so frequency, um, intensity, duration. So it, and the longer it goes on, the longer you can have harm. Um, this is something actually, it's really interesting. So there was um, a CEO. Now, I don't believe this would ever happen. I just thought, wow, uh, I don't think it would happen in the salon industry. I would hope not anyway. But there was a CEO in France in 2019, I believe. Uh, he was in prison because 35 employees had death by suicide. And he oh was found, he was found guilty. He, at, at, at fault. So it's one of those things where we underestimate the um, impact of a culture uh, and any relationship, really. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think that's also a nice thing to check in with is frequency, duration, oh. intensity. <laughs> yes. Because the, the truth is, is in communication, and I, and I think you set that up really beautifully for those that might have just be joining us, that when we start to look at this stuff, we have to do it with compassion for ourselves too, because we all do this. Like there's not a single person out there, maybe the Dalai Lama, or maybe <laughs> yeah. but other than that, most of us are going to have times where we're going to say something that we didn't realize hurt or like caused that little moment of, of pain. But if it's happening often, okay, we got to check, check in. If the intensity is really strong, oof, okay, you got to check in a little bit here. If it's happening, you know, um, if you're finding yourself in it for a long period of time, we got to check in. But there's some forgiveness too to this, right? Yeah. Like yes. we, we have to know that like we're not always going to be green light communicators. Exactly, Andrew. And I, and I'll, I wouldn't want to set it up. Sorry, I have such a tickle in my throat now. Um, but I wouldn't want to set it up so that people don't feel like that, so that people feel like all is lost if they're recognizing any of these things. And it's, it is not. Everything is repairable. And actually, you it's, it's beautiful to see when we actually come forth and be like, you know what? I haven't always been psychologically safe. And I am willing to learn and grow. That right there, you just built the foundation for trust. And that is that little bit of vulnerability and that, that, you know, just that awareness and saying, basically, I, I'm sorry and I want to do better. And that's all it takes. I mean, even with parenting, when they talk about safe relationships and parenting, you really, um, in order to have a beautiful relationship and, and a safe relationship with your child, you actually only have to have 30% of that. Like that's, that's what the stats show. If you're 30% willing to admit fault, if you're 30% um, vulnerable, and if you're 30% there to help with the attachment in your relationship with your child, then that's enough to make a secure relationship. And so it's not about perfection at all, Andrew. It's, it's about, again, having the willingness, the openness, the curiosity in order to help these relationships and recognize that we have a huge impact on other people. And especially when we're in this industry, before I, I really want to make sure I make this point before we're done, because 
I, I feel so strongly about it. And that is, we don't, I don't know if any of us as beauty professionals truly recognize our impact. As I was researching this, there's actually articles about it, like Psychology Today has one about how people share with their specifically hairstylists, but any beauty professional, um, how much they share more than their, their therapists. I mean, my goodness, we even call ourselves therapists sometimes, right? And so like, yeah, I think it's the funniest thing, but um, we have, that means that we have an impact on people. So if I can really take the onus to be a psychologically safe individual, um, then I can have a great impact on those in my chair. And I highly recommend that anybody here who is loving this topic and you want to be that, that you go and do your psychological, um, your mental health first aid. Because if you're a mental health first aider, you'll be um, shocked at how much you'll use those skills. Uh, and I don't teach that, but I did set it up in, in Newfoundland. We've started doing it with hairstylists here, um, which is really cool. And so, but I, I, wherever it is, there's programs available in your, in your city, in your area for sure. And it's so helpful, Andrew, to have that skill set. And I believe because we have such a beautiful influence, um, I believe that it's something that can really change, can change the world. And I'm, that may sound big, but I think it's true. Oh, I totally agree with you. I a hundred percent agree. And Shirley said underpaid therapist. And when he said, Oh Lord, yes, <laughs> because it's so true. We, um, I actually was one of the first people to know about one of my clients, um, husband's suicide. Yeah, she she had not felt comfortable to talk to her friends about it, her family. I was the first person she talked to about it, and I I was really thankful at that point that I had started my coach training. Yes, because I had the training to know how to stay neutral with being handed information like that. And I I would imagine that some of you out there watching have had some of these moments where it's almost like, whoo, okay, wow they just handed me something really huge here. What do I do with this? And, you know, because sometimes our first reaction isn't necessarily the most psychological safe aspect either, which might be coddling or, you know, you know, uh, over sympathetic, over sympathizing. So I think I, my point is I, I fully agree. I, I actually think that part of our cosmetology uh, education should be how do we be safe behind the chair with these levels of conversations that are thrown at us because a lot of times we don't even have a choice it's just like oh hey andrew guess what yeah and it's it's funny because um so compassion fatigue what we don't because we're not in the medical industry and it's usually used for nurses and doctors and whatever Mm -hmm. um it's actually called secondary trauma it's the trauma that gets shared with us that then we take on as our own. And I recognized when I was, again, when I was going through all this information, I was, I knew I had hit something here for the salon industry because of this, because of the like the overarching themes of psychological safety. When I read compassion, I said, Oh my God, how many, or Oh my goodness. Like how many times have I had somebody in my chair share something with me? And then I'm by the end of my day, I'm so emotionally exhausted that then I go home and I get short with my husband and then it starts an argument there. You know, I'm not saying that's happened, but it, you know, this is, it's happened. And so, but in these ways, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm making a little light of it, but it's, it's true. So then it, it reaches over. And then what, what, this is what really Andrew, um, I, I really want to uh, leave this with people. This is why we are not bad people. And I would love for us to stop judging our behavior and start getting curious about our behavior. And then as well, the behavior of others as well. Because the moment that we can stop blaming or uh, shaming behavior in ourselves and in others, because we have an off day, we have an off moment, like who doesn't, then the more psychologically safe this entire world will be. And again, I know I'm talking big, but super passionate about it because I think it's true. And so if I can actually be like, okay, you know what? I had an off day. I know why I'm going to give you an example on uh, this weekend. So uh, I I'm in this work, right? Like I'm doing this work all the time. I know you are too, Andrew, like nervous system regulation. There's so many topics I can get into uh, about how you really do get into psychological safety and being psychologically safe. But 
Um, on Saturday, my dog has just had surgery. He slipped. He hurt himself again. Uh, it, luckily, it was temporary, but my nervous system just went from zero to 100. And then that night, we had people over. And my friend was talking to me about it. And I was I didn't realize how dysregulated my nervous system was. I was pure yellow zone, tipping in the red zone. And I actually lost my, my cool at her. And for a moment, I felt shame because, you know, I had this storyline in my head, like I'm a coach. I should know better. You know, I'm a psychological safety facilitator. I should know better. Why, how, why did I blow up? And then I had a moment of compassion for myself and said, Stephanie, because you've had a really rough day. That's it. And mm -hmm. luckily my friendship can survive me losing my temper for just a moment. And she took the apology and that was it. So th this is not about perfection. It's about giving compassion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Beautiful. And thank you so much for that story, because one of the things I've always appreciated about you, just even through your social media, is your vulnerability, your willingness to say, hey, look, I am a coach. Like, this is the stuff I studied. Mm -hmm. And I still dropped the ball today. So... I think those types of stories help us all feel like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, look at Stephanie. She's she studies this stuff. She teaches this stuff. Even if she lost her cool with her friend. Okay, yeah. cool. I don't have to beat myself up so much about this kind of stuff. So thank you for that honesty. How we, as we start to wrap this up, how how are you bringing this to the salon industry? Because I know that that's your your big passion now is actually taking yeah. this and bringing it specifically to the salon industry. So I have um, started a program that is called Psychologically Safe Salons. And I am um, taking applications for it, like taking phone calls. It does, it does need to be um, a certain amount of willingness to do the work, right? So there is work involved, as you know, Andrew, when uh, taking on any coaching client. But I'm going into salons, so you can do Psychologically Safe Salons. It is... Um, You'll get a certificate at the end uh, and basically we'll do a two day training where I will share with the leaders first how they can be psychologically safe leaders. And even just nitty, little nitty things that people don't recognize that are actually, at least in Canada, and I'm pretty sure in the U.S. too, it's your responsibility as an employer to do. Most people have no clue about. They have no idea that legally, if you employ people, that you must follow these steps. And so... Um, I go through that with them. And then I go through with the whole team. We do uh, a beautiful interactive day and a half because the half days with the leaders, we do a day and a half program where um, I bring them through a whole bunch of activities that get them into looking at really in depth. How do we reduce harm? Number one. And then the fun part, how do we increase well-being? And I'm really passionate about that because it's all the, you know, the self-care stuff that we I think we've heard so much of it. We're almost like zooming past it. It's almost like we're having, um, we're almost like ignoring it now because it's in our faces so much, but it's something we actually need the most of because that's how we get green light, right? Is the, have the care and the compassion we have for ourselves. So we, it's, it's a pretty fun um, day and a half process, super informative, something like you said, we should have had in school. And I'm, I'm really proud. I'm really proud to be bringing this to the salon industry. So they can just, they can reach me to get in touch if they're curious. Cool. And is the best way to do that through wavesociety.ca? Uh, they can do either or um, that. There's an email, like as soon as you go in, contact me um, mm -hmm. or they can DM me. So whatever way through Instagram or through Facebook, if you happen to have me on there. Um, yeah, you can do, I'll, I'll take your call no matter where you know, <laughs> I'm cool. Yeah. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much. This is absolutely enlightening as far as, uh, you know, how psychological safety can benefit. I think all of us on so many levels, not just in our workplace, but yeah. I definitely see how much impact it can have, especially within the salon world, from the leadership to the stylist, and then also from the stylist to the actual client. It, this is going to be a really epic, really huge for our industry. So thank you for bringing this to us. Thanks for having me on to talk about it. As you can tell, I love it. <laughs> no, you, what? Really? <laughs> uh, thank you, Stephanie. Have an awesome rest of your evening. You too. Bye, Andrew. Bye, everyone. Thank you.